Well, 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 ladies and gentlemen, game journalists are back doing what they do best, telling gamers what games they're supposed to enjoy. Now that the game is really struggling to break over 50,000 active users on Steam and reports about its poor sales are beginning to circulate, gaming journalists are looking around for someone to blame. And of course, it's people that make videos about games on YouTube. Of course, of course, that's that's who's to blame. Of course, who else would it be? And while I obviously do not single-handedly with my small little channel have the power to destroy a mighty behemoth like Bioware, because trust me, Bioware are very good at destroying Bioware. In fact, I don't think anyone in the world is better at ruining Bioware than Bioware. Nonetheless, I do feel the need to kind of defend YouTube commentary on games and explain why I think some of the comments coming out are absolute trash. But before I get into what I think is one of the worst articles on this topic, written by what is, of course, one of objectively the worst journalistic outlets in the world, Vice News, of course it is, I want to quickly start by hedging that I think the vast majority of YouTube criticism of Dragon Age Veilguard has not been over the gender political issues. Most of the criticism I've seen from large YouTubers in the space, people like Gamerax, Skill Up, Vextra Life, has all been a standard gameplay review of the game, calling it more or less a 7 out of 10, an okay game, blah blah blah, kind of standard, standard game criticism stuff. So the insinuation that suddenly objective criticism of games relies on game journalistic outputs is laughable, for reasons we'll also get to later that you're probably already thinking of, but the idea that all criticism of video games on YouTube is somehow from the political right criticizing DEI issues within the games is just patently false, even if you look at the viewership for the channels doing that versus the channels that do more socio-narrative criticism of those style of games or political, it still vastly favors the gameplay if you look at the actual numbers. Of but with that necessary caveat and without further ado, let's get into the article so that we can suffer through this together because I feel we have to, or at least I have to, and I hope you'll stick around. The article is by Dwayne Jenkins, who writes for Vice.com. As I said before, we're going back to the trenches with this one, he writes. So it's no secret, Dragon Age The Veil Guard is the latest DEI game to be subjected to criticism with zero bearing on the actual game itself. Now, if you're of like university age or you're still in formal education or you have any intention of ever going back to formal education, look at the way he begins this article and then never do it ever in your entire time in formal education. Stating the conclusion as if it's a fact at the beginning of your essay, article, whatever, is a sheer sign that you are a moron. One thing I'll say as somebody that spent years and years marking too many essays for too little pay is that the minute you see a student do this, or it, frankly, anyone do this in, in any form of written prose, they're a moron and you're a, my, 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 the signals are already flaring for stupidity. Um, it's just, uh, yeah. Anyways, composure. Because I am tired and already exhausted myself talking about diversity in games, I'll keep this one mercifully brief. Please do. Now, the irony of me saying this from the gaming vertical isn't lost on me. I love the vert gaming vertical, a little, little insert of corporate speak in there. Even if I'm the wrong messenger, I can only hope the message itself is meaningful enough. Let's imagine a world without video game outlets. No IGN, no Kotaku, no Polygon. They just all poof. Overnight, gone. No more reviews or insights from games journalists. Like and comment down below if you now have John Lennon's Imagine, albeit with different lyrics stuck in your head. He continues the article with, You know what that leaves you with to gauge how good a game is? Censoring on Metacritic has gotten completely out of hand. Not a smart move if you want to stay relevant in business, because this whole New World Order, Great Reset, woke Psypop has failed. Narrative's crumbling and everybody's not bailing out in time. We'll go down with it. This, in case you couldn't tell, is a user review from Metacritic. Again, this doesn't prove anything that he's trying to claim here. Yeah, Metacritic has bad reviews. Metacritic has always had bad user reviews. Metacritic has always had a problem with kind of group think and negative review spam. Big whoop. Uh, that doesn't defend games journalism as games journalism by any metric. 
poorly written, crazy Metacritic reviews do not prove that major, hugely successful game review outlets on YouTube are not an accurate source of gaming journalism. In fact, almost unanimously within the gaming community, those channels, channels like GamerX, are considered much more reliable sources of reviews than any of the outlets that he just listed for good reason. And this is an obvious and relevant point that anyone criticizing the YouTube space in favor of the established games journalism space would need to account for in even a basic argument which is not addressed whatsoever. Furthermore, he's totally leaving out the possibility of established media, like major newspapers, also being able to review games, which they do, often with varying degrees of success. The reason that they don't bring up this in this instance is actually a lot of mainstream journalistic outputs have been quite critical of The Veilguard, with it getting a 3 out of 5 from The Guardian, and even some mainstream outlets criticizing its portrayal of DEI issues within the game as cringe and unhelpful. Now, I'm not a fan of accusing people of logical fallacies, because if you actually know anything about formal logic, logical fallacies actually aren't all that helpful in explaining why arguments are bad. But this guy really just is straw manning the absolute crap out of this issue. He goes on to continue talking about really bad reviews. Dragon Age The Veil Guard is a lesson to us all. I really want you to read that review. Let it nestle within your brain for a second. Now, what did you meaningfully glean from that? What information in that excerpt will help you decide whether Veilguard is worth your time? That the game has characters of different ethnicities and that's bad? This brand of criticism extends to YouTube where content creators aren't bound by any kind of journalistic integrity. <laughs> Sure, a few YouTubers provide thoughtful feedback on the strengths and weaknesses of a game, but some of them couldn't care less about worthwhile, relevant, informed discourse. Again, this goes against how the article began, saying that in general terms, YouTube criticism is all this nonsense. You can't, at one moment, tarnish all of YouTube reviewers with bad Metacritic reviews, which is also a distinct platform. You're not going to get a following on YouTube by writing weird, bad Metacritic reviews. And then on the other hand, say that some YouTubers provide thoughtful criticism. That wasn't your claim at the start of the article. Let's go back to the start of the article now. He says at the start of the article that we would be left with nothing but bad Metacritic reviews to judge the strength of a game. Now, they've shifted the goalposts completely in this article, and the claim is that while some YouTubers are good, we could be misled by the ones that don't care about the game in any detail. He bemoans the fact that some of these YouTubers don't care less about worthwhile, relevant, informed discourse. They don't have to talk about gameplay, visuals, characters, story, pacing, mechanics, or any of the other nuances one looks for in a traditional review for the game. Instead, they can turn on their camera and say a game sucks because it has pronouns in it, or features too much diversity, or ruined a franchise by introducing any other sexual orientation that isn't straight, or gender identity that isn't man or woman. This isn't a conversation, a point at all, just noise. Well, there's a lot of incoherency in all of these paragraphs because they're talking about like 15 different ideas at once, but let's try and break down and somewhat make sense of what they are attempting to say. First of all, not all commentary on the internet is a review. It would be really, really sad if all commentary on literature, media, and various other things was reduced merely to a review. People can talk about how much they love J.R.R. Tolkien or which book is the best in the Lord of the Rings series without necessarily needing to provide a breakdown review of The Fellowship of the Ring, The Two Towers, and The Return of the King. There's not reviews. Not all commentary is a review. You can write a commentary on an ancient Greek or Latin text discussing what's within it without providing a summative review. Reviews are just not the only mode for conveying criticism of a type of media. That's been the case really since the days of Rome and ancient Greece. I don't know why it's so weird that people are now doing it on YouTube because they've been doing it throughout all of human history. And it's here you really get just a sense of how entitled these journalists are that they think reviews, formal reviews with a 10 out of 10 score at the end is the only way to discuss a piece of media. It simply isn't and it never has been. And even if some commentary on the internet is below whatever quote unquote standard of discourse this guy has decided that we all mutually signed up and agreed to, then let the free market of ideas decide which channels are 
doing well and which channels are doing bad because people find that commentary useful or engaging. If the end users really did think that gaming journalists were providing so much value, then Kotaku's YouTube channel would be doing a lot better than it currently is compared to a lot of even small YouTubers. The reality is the audience isn't there because a lot of these gaming outlets don't provide any value. The only way that they can provide value to users and thus generate clicks and views is by their connections within the gaming industry, thus getting to play the games earlier. They then go on to one of the weirdest comments that I've seen, which is to say, it's funny though, Dragon Age the Veil Guard is getting lambasted for its inclusive elements because it apparently isn't a 10 out of 10 masterpiece. Meanwhile, I don't recall Boulder's Gate 3 getting a whole lot of flack for, oh, wait, never mind. I guess I had a momentary mental lapse. God, the prose here just makes, it hurts me to actually read it. But traditionally, people will excuse all that gross diversity if the quality is high enough. But true to form, the bar is only cleared once perfection is agreed upon. No real world parallels there at all. I don't even understand this. This is a barely, in, barely intelligible English to me. Maybe I live on a different planet. First of all, I think there's a whole nother YouTube video I could make about why people have received uh, Dragon Age The Veil Guard different than Baldur's Gate 3. But one thing I'll say on the difference between the two is that people have a very, very different outlook on games that might have a cultural tone to them, but don't have what I call didactic storyline. A you can be somebody that is not super interested in Catholic Christianity and still enjoy the Lord of the Rings. Is there a huge amount of uh, Catholic messaging in Lord of the Rings if you really understand Tolkien's subtext? Yeah. Do you need to appreciate that subtext or is that subtext forced right into your face every five seconds? No, you can watch the Lord of the Rings, enjoy the Lord of the Rings, read Lord of the Rings and never really encounter a lot of that Catholic subtext. That's not possible from what I've seen from watching people play the Veil Guard for hours, hours that I wish I had back, but at least I haven't had to play the game myself. But I feel bad even indulging in this line of argument because it's, it's entirely beside the point. They began the article by claiming that without Kotaku, without IGN, we would be left relying on kooky Metacritic reviews to judge whether games are good or not. This is simply incredibly and absolutely false. And the fact that someone can tell say that with a straight face really shows you the depth, the absolute depths that modern day games journalism has stooped to. And it's part of something I've ranted about on this channel a lot, which is the this cultural difference in gaming between the literati who have come in, particularly in journalist and game design circles, and the way that they look at the average gamer and basically consider their opinions to be overwhelmingly stupid and false based on the fact that they're not educated enough to know what games they like or don't like or what things are important for them in a game. The idea, really, what they're really saying, even though their argument really doesn't imply it because there's no argument here in this article really whatsoever, is that ultimately, gamers are just too stupid. And if we didn't have IGN and Kotaku, God, how would we ever make up our minds? We'd be all reduced to loony people on Metacritic without the better angels of our nature at Kotaku to tell us what games we should enjoy. I'm just, it's, it's, it's getting, it's getting exhausting. Uh, it's getting exhausting. In the end, I'm probably taking this entire article far too seriously because we all know why they're actually critical of YouTubers and they want YouTube commentary to stop because they cannot control it and it is a direct competitor for their ad revenue. They used to have a very sweet relationship with publishers. They have exclusive access to games. They give games good reviews to keep their exclusive access to the publishers then they get to get all the clicks on the guides for those games because they can release the early guides before anyone else has a chance to play the game and thus generate also players for those games. It's a nice ecosystem between them and the publisher where they get clicks from exclusive access and the publisher gets a good reviews through a consistent relationship. Nowadays, YouTube commentary is ruining all of that and it's siphoning the clicks and the ad revenue. That's why they hate it. It's just depressing. And on that note, I'll see you next time. Until then, peace out.